What's up, Bone Ponies? It is your boy Neil here with uh, a new uh, a new little approach we're doing here at Tabletop Totality. We are uh, going to start trying to do a new form of reviews for any of our tabletop RPGs out there that we enjoy, um, which is going to take a format of a character creation episode a playing well a couple playing episodes and then a review of the system so you guys at home can see the whole stretch from us figuring it out to us playing it and why we review it the way we review it so this way it can help you also find a new tabletop rpg game to enjoy, laugh at, cry maybe, um, if you get some nat ones or whatever is the nat one considered in your game. Um, today I'm here with a great guest named Robert. Um, he's going to be doing uh, character creation for our Simba Room one shot that will be coming up shortly. Um, some of uh, you other Bone Ponies might know Robert as he has played on many of our live plays and things of this nature. You excited, Robert? You know it. All right. So without um, any more on my part, we're just going to dive into it and start character creation for the game Simba Room. Um, as some of you may know, Simba Room is a game that we have all enjoyed uh several times and have played it also a, a good chunk of times um uh, for live plays and things of that nature we've already had a review out there so we're going to start in character creation um it's a dark fantasy it's very uh very almost realist i would uh i would say wouldn't you agree robert yeah i agree with that there's there's a little bit of leveling, but they do a really good job of keeping it real, real basic, real simple. So yeah. um, you, you don't get overpowered necessarily very quick, quickly, and uh, any scenario you encounter could be your last <laughs> all the time. <laughs> that's yeah, that's that's very true. Um, for this character creation, we are gonna do a little bit of a start on how you would normally start for a beginning level character. Um, the characters that we will be creating and using for the one shot are going to be a little bit higher leveled so you can see what the middle of gameplay would look like when we do our one shot. So at least for now, we're going to start it off of doing the first, very first preliminary things you would do for a character sheet. Um, Robert, do yeah, you have... I would also... Oh, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say, I'd like to add, you know, we, we're talking about leveling. And they, they don't even have levels in this game. You that's know, true. It's, it's really about experience. So how experienced are you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like the other interesting point, um, you know, kind of the, the earlier point I was making is that it's, it's more about e experience with characters. But, um, you know, the lowly arrow can fell the mightiest warrior in this game, which is... Oh, that, yeah, big time. Yeah. 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 So um it could be the simplest yeah. like all of the great heroes in history you could read about that just get taken out from the simplest combat. Nothing, yeah. you know, oh they fell off their horse and that was it. You know, yeah. things things of that One nature. <laughs> yeah. This game really encapsulates that. My bone pony broke a leg and now <laughs> I've broken my neck. <laughs> <laughs> So each of the players, because we will be also having Steve and Cody, my other attendees, um, participating in this game. And the group has already had a conversation. We've kind of already had a session zero, as is um, talked about, for character ideas. Um, Robert, what was your character idea? Kind of what, you know, every time you go into character creation, the book's always going to explain to you what it looks like in the system, but you always need to have that idea of what am I really trying to play? And, and what was that idea for you, Robert? Sure. So, um, because the setting for Simba Room is kind of in this fallen empire, um, my uh, initial thought and character idea was to come up with a, a treasure hunter, somebody who mm -hmm. kind of goes through the ruins of Simba Room, 
um, in the dark places and the caves um, and finds these lost technologies and lost relics um, to bring back and either sell uh, to the different groups, uh, primarily out of Thistlehold, um, or to keep and to advance, like, you know, missing technologies. Um, gotcha. So that's kind of the, the starting point that I based from. That that sounds like a pretty cool character idea. Can't wait to see how we end up creating it. Um, so let's, you know, take in conversation the first steps in how to create a character. This is, I will actually pull it up so you can see it in the PDF here. Um, it is right along this aspect here and page 74 you know how to how to create a character there's uh they talk about a lot of different mechanics in this step and one of those mechanics primarily being um archetypes which is almost like uh backgrounds they talk about it as like the warrior mystic and rogue um it's the best way to fit your role for the group um is kind of how they do that it would be equivalent to um you know are you melee range wizard like that style of things not so much a class from systems like dungeons and dragons or anything like that it's a little bit different on that on that level um because even though you pick your archetype you still get an occupation which like robert was saying you know he's he's kind of a treasure hunter that's what his character is going to be that's kind of like what his occupation is going to be that treasure hunter merchant um person who goes out collects all these relics and sets, sells them pretty much to the highest bidder so that's that's what his his mp or his player is going to be looking like npc <laughs> <We're> just... <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> you're not, not even a player Neil's, Neil's gonna play it. <laughs> yeah. um the next thing that they talk about is attributes um this they do a standard distribution or a point by system and your attributes are as you can see on the character sheet over there they are accurate cunning discreet persuasive quick resolute strong and vigilant this is everything that is going to determine your checks for how the end game works um there's the you know and this is just talking about what your scores would be you know there's no real rolling system to do your scores like D, &D has um but D, D has a standard distribution they have a point by system as well so it won't be anything too different for anybody uh coming in from a different uh game i actually like this system for point by it's simple it's straightforward there's yeah. no math with trying to figure out, well, if I want to have two points here, what do I do? It's kind of like, nope, here's your distribution. You get 80 points, distribute them as you want, or you yep. take the standard distribution, which is also based on 80 points, yep. and you could then modify the standard distribution, which is, is kind of one of the things I like to do. Yeah, I think, I think that's always a great way if you're coming into it. You want to have some differences from the typical distribution but you don't want to have to worry about calculating the points all by yourself take that standard array plug it in and swap out well i don't need this many 15s or you know what i don't want this 10 i would still rather have a higher of a five you know take it take it that way um the big thing that these attributes do it's almost as if it's uh how talented your character is in something so you're gonna have checks related to a, a, an attribute like uh for example accurate ends up being can be i should say one of the attributes to see if you can hit somebody and that check is going to be rolled on a d20 and as long as your d20 is in the range of what your attribute is so, you know, if it's a 15, you have a really good accurate, you can get anywhere from a 15 or lower and you succeed. But if you go higher than that 15, you will fail. So it's a little bit different than some other systems. We go, you know, kind of golf, golf playing wise, you know, you want lower numbers, the better, the lower they are, the better they are. Um, but you will still also have outside factors that impact you know that that's where you'll get some minuses or some pluses to your role 
and you can become either better at it or worse at it because of limiting factors. Um, we'll kind of go into that a little bit more later on. But while you're choosing these attributes, you know, you want to make sure you're doing something that's going to be beneficial to your character. Um, and then, you know, they have amazing art in this book, mind you. One of the things that always sold me on it right on the right on the get go. The artists that they got really captured the whole aspect of it so after attributes you have your races um races in simbroom there's um not too many in the core rule book they they don't really have like i feel like things like a lot of other tabletop rpgs they try and have so many different races so you can be so diverse this is very very simple you know, you have two different forms of humans, Ombrians or Barbarians, Elves, Goblins, and uh, Ogres are pretty much the... Oh, and Changelings. I almost forgot about them. Um, those are your, your core core races. Each of them are a little different. Like, your, og your Ogres are kind of your, your brutes of the family. Um, goblins are not traditionally, like, how a lot of other rpgs depict them they can be varying in sizes they're not all super short um and then your ombrians are your your humans that have come in and started to settle this land and your barbarians are the are the natural inhabitants inhabit oh my lord i cannot say this word they're, they're the people who have who have lived there for a long time that's <laughs> Sometimes you struggle, you gotta find a new word. Native. <laughs> um, native. Yeah, they are the natives to the land. Um, while the Ombrians have relocated because of a great travesty in their original origin. Um, each of them kind of gives different traits, different abilities, um, that they're gonna be a little bit better at, a little bit of different perks, like any other game um abilities is similar to like feats in dungeons and dragons it's just you know what your character's talents really thrive to what you're going to add to the group are you going to be a great scout do you are you good at finding herbs medicine can you treat people are you a wizard that's where all of these are going to come from are you great in combat this is where it's going to come from that's why you know your archetypes your occupation don't so much select those things. They help you in building your character. Um, and then you have mystical traditions, which is how do you come about your magical origin? Do you, you know, were you taught? Were you just now uh, a natural witch and, you know, learned through natural means? Because magic does not come at any cost in Simbaroon. It is uh, inlaid with corruption. There has to be a price to pay. And that price ends up being corruption. And as if you take and take greed greedily and greedily, corruption will fail your body and you will become an abomination. For at least what you need to know character creation wise. And, and lose your mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot, like, a lot of negative consequences with um imbibing in the corruption <laughs> exactly but there has been don't get too drunk yeah <laughs> yeah exactly have a taste but don't have too much don't um, black out. yeah you won't remember what you did but that's you why destroy a village. magical traditions have been involved there's been you know the the church has their own ways of practicing that keep you corruption safe then there is an actually the a, a you know cult of wizards that have developed their ways of keeping it safe and so they give you More aspects scientific than religious yeah, yeah yeah um they give you aspects to be able to play in many different character creations there's you know even just in the core rule book without all of their additional rules which they have plenty they have added on they have an advanced players guide a bunch of different books above this um but even in just this this core rule book, you have many different r routes to create a uh, a character. Mm -hmm. um, yep. 
and then the shadow is what um is a big it is a big aspect of Simbaroon. There's this um no matter what aspect of the book you're looking into or even if you're looking into campaigns, there's almost the shadow that looms over the whole world. And that is the corruption. So your shadow depicts how corrupted you are. What what where were you birthed? Um, what do you work best in? Are you are you an urban soul or a rural soul? And that's depicted through your shadow. Um, it is kind of your your spiritual expression. Aura. Yeah. No, no, aura, aura is 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 the is probably the best way to do it. Um, certain things will allow you to see. Certain abilities will allow you to see this. Certain creatures are just naturally gifted to be able to see um auras and it'll help you figure out what is already corrupted what is you know if you have those yeah. abilities how to navigate simber how how far corrupted are they <laughs> exactly because and and they could like this game is great at it's very low math high description factor um, everything is written so you can describe things. You can, you know, really get into the RP of aspects and uh, just kind of paint the world with your own brush. Of course, equipment's going to be in this. There's uh, starting equipment that each, you know, each character gets for, you know, what their abilities are, things of that nature. Um, we will kind of be following a lot of this like you know this the, your your starting gear is always going to be you know what's there you're going to start off robert with um you know camping gear that consists of a sleeping roll cooking equipment firewood a trinket from your backstory these they're they're all nice little things that you get to add in to create a character um your weapons they give you kind of a, a different approach. You kind of almost have three three aspects that you can choose from. Um, you know, you get to have to, to, to let me just make sure I'm reading this right before I just tell you what you get. So you get a dagger and anything associated with the abilities you end up choosing. Um and then you also get to select the combination that they have here of a sturdy staff and a dagger, a single handed weapon and a dagger, a ranged weapon and a dagger. Um, and a character will always start with ordinary light armor. If you wanted something better, you'd end up having to uh, pay for that with your starting, um, your starting budget for a level one character. Money in this game, everybody starts with five thousand. So let me just put that five thousand right into your character sheet already. Boom, five thousand. You got your starting equipment, which we're just gonna know that is you know your your sleeping roll, everything like that, and then uh, what combination? Well, we'll get back to the combination of weapons right now because we don't know what attributes and stuff you're going to select. So we're going to go a little bit off of what they're saying. Um, but the money goes in Thaler, Shillings, and Orteg. Um, it's a little bit different. You got to learn a new yeah, money system. You're like in, it's like Thaler is what? Gold? Filling is like silver, or tag is kind of like copper, so pretty much. Maybe that, yeah. I mean, um, if you're D and D person, yeah, Thaler, Thalers make me holler. Yeah, Thalers make you holler. Um, <laughs> usually, or tags are like your your con like even in in the aspect of like gold, silver, copper. Um, looking and rare, at rare, uncommon, common, right? Yeah, so Ortag is like the common. That's what currency. everybody is spending. That's right. that's usually is like down to a peasant. That's what they're paying for meals. That's what you're paying for says stuff like that. 
um your shilling currency <laughs> you, you know your shilling though is is all right i live in the city or i live in a high-end town this is now what i have to pay for everyday things and then your thalers oof, you're you know you're buying a house you're getting a boat you know you're you're up and up if you're if you're just throwing thalers every day you know? yeah so five thalers is a pretty good starting you can you can do a lot for your baseline equipment um, we'll see and then, you know, they, they end up mentioning, what's what's your personality going to be? We kind of talked about that already a little bit of what your character's driving force is, kind of what your goals are. But do you have a personality for your character? Are they going to be, uh, you know, dumb-witted? Are they going to are they gonna be have a dry sense of humor? You know, what, what are they going to be? What are you thinking? Definitely, probably on the witty side. Gotcha. Um, whether or not that's dry or not, I think maybe dad jokes. Let's stick to dad jokes. Dad jokes. So dry. Yeah, let's Every, do dad jokes. Everybody enjoys dad jokes. Yeah. That is very true. Hey, Neil, what's red and bad for your teeth? What? A brick. <laughs> that's fair. That's, it's not good for your teeth. <laughs> Don't, not good for us over here at Tabletop Totality do not condone eating of bricks. It's not, <laughs> it's not good. Not good. Um, so there's the aspect of uh, the, the first thing that the book gets into after all of these explanations, quick, quick introductions. Um, they give you, uh, you know, a basic character sheet. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a character sheet. Um, similar to this, um, with a little bit of differences. Um, it'll be typed for one, I guess. That's the that's the big one. Um, I will need a sketch of your the what your character is gonna look like by the end of this, Robert. So yeah. okay, <laughs> you gotta shake off the the drawing sho shoes. Yeah, that's it. Dust them off. Get it ready. Um, so the next thing they go into, the first thing they go into is uh, kind of archetypes. What what aspects are you looking for? Are you looking for a warrior? They'll tell you, all right, here's, you know, barbarian clans because they're known to be good warriors, warriors and races. What races work well as a warrior? Archetype, some quick attributes you you should pick you know, to make sure you have a strong warrior. So, like, a warrior's attributes, their primary one's going to be strong, followed by accurate and quick. Um, as you play more and more, there'll always be different ways to move it around because we could spend a whole aspect of explaining all of the different abilities. Abilities will allow you to change, to substitute some attributes for others so sometimes you can take an ability and instead of using accurate for it you'll use quick and mm -hmm. now and now that's anything that needs to take an accurate accurate test is going to take a quick test um so really this is just a you know these aren't rules as written to be a warrior this is what you have to do no these are just guidelines they're trying to give you something that if you wanted to follow it here's an easy way to do it um and then what they do after you know writing in warriors abilities they'll even tell you well if this is you know what you want to use attribute wise here's good abilities to match those attributes um they then give you the aspect of kind of like uh this is where the occupations kind of fall in you know, so if you're a warrior archetype, this is this is one of the things you could be doing. Um, yeah. You know, you could be. Go ahead, Robert. I was just gonna say it's kind of like you back into it a little bit. So you're mm -hmm. kind of like, what do you want to do? And then you kind of find the general arch archetype that fits that model, yeah. right? And all the archetypes have a general description of what they what they are, and they're they're very broad. So, yes. like, for the treasure hunter, for instance, or merchant, kind of doesn't, uh, it falls more in line with the rogue archetype that they have built. Yep. Um, 
And so from that perspective, they actually they actually have a treasure hunter um, that yes. you could use, or you could go further into say, okay, well, I like I like some of this, but I want to change it, right? And yeah. I want to do something a little different. So one of the things that I was really interested in for my character is this idea of being a merchant, right? Um, so treasure hunter is good, but that only kind of picks up maybe the one aspect that is half of the coin to what I'd really like my character to be, which is the, the ability to, to communicate and to um, sell things. So one yeah. of the attributes that I became really interested in was going more heavily on the persuasive. Um, so the treasure hunter, for instance, doesn't, is um, cunning and quick, uh, less so on the per persuasive. So one of the things I I would like to do is switch my persuasive skill to being more highly, yeah. um, higher regarded. Yeah. So like in these archetypes, they break it down: warrior, mystic, rogue. Um, is is pretty much the breakdowns. But in those archetype breakdowns, they give you basic starting points. Well, if you wanted to be a warrior berserk, that's what you would. That's what you would kind of do. Oh, hey, Liz! <laughs> but yeah, if uh, if you wanted to be a warrior archetype, but be that kind of berserk barbarian, this is what they would suggest for you. You know, they would they would suggest you to have strong and quick. You know, choose a race that's that's something of those natures that's already going to help you. So the barbarian, which is a human and an ogre or an ogre would be good berserk warrior archetypes. Right. And right. then I... they, they they'll show you a bunch of different ones. There's a cell sword. There's a captain that all highlight. Well, these are all warriors, but they're different archetypes. And again, you don't have to follow this. You could just completely skip this this aspect of the book if you knew what you wanted to create but i strongly recommend first character look at how they have mm -hmm. it all set up you know yeah. and then as robert yeah. said well i don't i like this aspect but i don't need that aspect i'm gonna switch that you know and and that'll work very well and here's the mystic, you know, they talk about what races work well for mystics, you know, thergy, the thergy and the ordo, they, they're very ombrian in nature. So, you know, that's, that's going to be a more ombrian thing, but your changelings, your goblins, there's going to be shamans coming in from the barbarian tribes. And that's where you'll get some of the, how do you say, you know, raw magicians, you know, they, they may not have what the Ombrians believe to be protection from the corruption of casting magic, they have learned to respect it and live with it in a way. Come from the streets. Yeah. It's between book learning and street learning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're the real deal. They're yeah. in the forest every day. Yeah. So a mystic would could be a witch. And that's that's the aspect they've maybe learned the balance on their own. They, they've been in the wilds. That's where they were taught um, between, you know, what's the next one? A uh, Not even the sorcerer, the, the thergy. You know, that would be somebody coming that's an Ombrian. They, they, they are a part of the Ombrian religion, which is Prius. Uh, you know, Toyota Prius. Praise, Toyota Prius. Praise, be. praise um, the Prius. Um, but Prius is is their religious aspect they worship the sun pretty much um and that is that is you know that would be an ombrian mystic where the witch would be a barbarian mystic or a goblin mystic mm -hmm. something along those lines we'll kind of go through there and then the rogue which is the best fitting for robert's idea of a character um because the rogues are going to be you know, they're going to be your more cunning, they're crafty, your treasure hunters, as we said, are rogues, and, uh, you know, your thugs. Um, so yeah, here's, here's what they, they state for a treasure hunter, you know, you're going to have a high cunning, a high quick, um, the suggested races, any human, ogre, or goblin, because they all are going to be easily portrayed in that. Honestly, 
just like in any other tabletop RPG, usually the humans are the most diverse. They can almost play anything you want them to do. And especially because they have two variants of humans. You have the Ombrians and the Barbarians. Um, which pretty much they just grow up in different cultures. And they're the two the two leading clashes right now in the area. Besides, of course, the elves against the humans. But that's a whole other debacle. Like two different cultures of human. Yeah. Yep. Um. So yeah, we're you know we're gonna go with the the aspect of the treasure hunter, but Robert just kind of wanted to modify it into a little bit of a you know yeah they go out they do the treasure hunting, but they they're also the ones who are selling things. They're the merchant. They're trying to you know start themselves up in that way, and treasure hunting may be the one thing that they 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 know how to do. To start their business. Yeah, my thought was when I read the rogue um, description, they talk a lot in the rogue that it, it covers diplomats, merchants, things like that. And yep. so I really felt that the treasure hunter, one, they have they have a kind of pre-made treasure hunter there. Yep. But that the rest of it would fall really well into that. So we can put for the occupation, you you know, your treasure hunter slash merchant. Um did you have an idea? I know races aren't here yet. Um, so actually, we'll wait on that. Um, so then we have the treasure hunter slash merchant. So now we have the attributes. We have an idea of roughly what important, what's an important attribute to you. Um, so I will, I will stop you for a quick second there yes. about the abilities and skipping race. So... Mm. I think some of this, too, you, you end up kind of jumping a little bit around because one of the things that becomes important uh, when you pick a race is some races have different abilities that you can select from as a part of your race. Yes. So one, one of the things that I like to do planning out the character is when I look at abilities and I think about abilities, I try to just make a list and say, hey, what are what is what is my availability? What are the things that I think would play really well to my character? Get that list together, and before I decide, you know, how I specialize in those abilities or which ones I really ultimately want to pick, I'll then look at my race to determine do I have any other abilities that could be advantageous mm -hmm. for the type of character I'm going to do, and I'll add those in to like my abilities list, right? Yep. Yeah, no, and I and I get exactly what you're saying because I do a very similar thing. I mean, we grew up yeah. playing these games together. It makes sense that we would have <laughs> similar ways to approach it. <laughs> um, but in the book, it kind of you know it suggests the races, and of course, you, the way it's laid out is not to go exactly in order. And I think right. that's the big thing we're saying. You know, don't right. be scared to jump around in that. To figure out, to take a look at the races, you know, then come back. Oh, I looked at the attributes, but now I have a better understanding. You're definitely going to have to jump around. You're definitely going to have to reread multiple things all over again. Um, because exactly it's like more Robert for said. It's flavor. Right? Yeah. It's for flavor. Yep, exactly. So what race were you thinking about? And why uh, are you thinking about that race? So I thought about being a goblin. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because I thought that in the forests of Davakar and in, you know, um, Simbarum in general, the goblins are kind of this one race that has been able to really m meld with human society, mm -hmm. mostly because of their skills that they can bring to the table and their affinity and knowledge for things that happen in Davakar, because goblins come from the forest. Yep. So the goblins are are routinely hired um, to be uh, guides through the forests of Davakar. So my thinking was that, oh, while well, being a goblin, I can have the treasure hunting aspect, but by also having the merchant ability, it's my ability to kind of take what I find in the forests back to human societies and, and sell it back to them, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a good fit. I like that. It's it's the aspect, you know, exactly as you said, you're you're the e one of the easier races to go into a place 
and come back out undetected. You know, you go to go into Davikar's forest where lot many of your you know your kin may already live <laughs> and be able to traverse that without being, you know, attacked or or questioned because you kind of look the part. But also coming back into a high adventuring town, nobody would question you either. Right. Because there would be many kind of like you. living living in both worlds. Exactly. So goblin is the race you're choosing for now. <laughs> <laughs> um and goblins are very like there's a lot of this book that I kind of have to skim over and I hope you as the viewer end up going and if you're going to go through this reading it and everything like that because it is it's really cool lore for each of these races even the humans have very interesting lore um what the what brought the ombrians up what the barbarians know the goblins they're short lived um but yeah, they we have, can get into some of those. They have they have some uh, beautiful beautiful tidbits of their own that I'll let you discover. We're a very vibrant race. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next spot up would be now that we kind of got a race selected, um, would be your attributes. And for that treasure hunter, you know, according to the book, they kind of recommend you having a cunning of thirteen plus. Or in a quick of 11 plus. And the reason why they kind of do that is because that treasure hunter, a lot of those attributes of cunning, um, it's kind of, it's your common sense as they explain it as, um, plus your actual schooling and education. Right. Your cunning tests are going to, how, how are you going to solve a problem? How are you going to, you know, face this riddle or this puzzle? That's where you're, you know, your problem solving, your puzzling, all of that comes in a cunning check. So that's why treasure hunters make sense. They need to be cunning to get in and out of ruins, dealing with any sort of problems on the way through the forest. And then the quick, you got to be quick if you're a treasure hunter. You know, that's gotta just be quick. That's just rule one. Like Wait. Indiana Jones. That's it. If you're gonna move. That idol off of its pedestal, you best do it fast. And um, he was not. No, he was pretty slow. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I can yeah. give you, um, so what I, uh, we, we talked about a little earlier was kind of the distribution, right? And yep. how you point by. So uh, what I did um, is I like to pick the standard distribution and then kind of tweak it yep. for the flavor that I'm looking for. So to your point, what I was thinking was I would do um, a 15 in cunning. Okay. A 13 in persuasive. Um, because again, persuasive is going to be one of For the that actually, merchant aspects. Right. And actually, let's switch those around. And um, I'll give you some of my reasoning in a second. All right. So we're going to do but 13 to, cunning. 13 cunning, 15 persuasive, persuasive, because again, the the merchant is really where I'm trying to, trying to build. So you're more of a merchant treasure hunter than a treasure hunting merchant. uh, Yeah, that probably is a little more accurate. (laughs) Um, And one of the things that I have to um, compete against as a part of a goblin is the goblin has um, these two traits as a part of their race, and one of them is a pariah, which means that in recognized human society i'm kind of looked looked down upon in civilized society yeah so if i want to be able to trade i feel like i need to have a really good um ability to persuade Mm -hmm. so that was the reasoning for me by um persuade so 15 persuade 13 in the cunning Mm -hmm. um i picked 11 because in the standard extra standard distribution that's the next highest would go into quick okay um, ten into resolute, ten into vigilant, nine into discreet, seven into accurate, and then five into strong. Into strong. So, my weakest abilities in strong and accurate really just resemble the fact that I am not a, not a fighter. I am a talker and a thinker. Yeah. So. You're you're not looking to fight the creatures that inhabit a ruin. You're just trying to get what they're hiding and get out. Right. Um, um, and so... Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, so like that would be how I use the standard distribution. Um, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also like to do a little more flavor from that perspective. Um, yeah. So what I, since everything is within that 80 point point by and the standard array is within that, I actually decided to drop my accurate down two points okay. and funnel those two into my cunning. So that way I could be a little little smarter, a little less accurate. <laughs> Again, my goal is uh not to be not to be in the fight if yeah. I can help it. Um uh and then uh the next thing I also did was I decided that I really wanted to even out the rest of my scores. And so I reduced my quick by one point to increase my Di, uh, discrete by one point, so I had tens, and do a little more standard distribution in that regard. So gotcha. um, I know no quick is still an important ability, but I also found that um, discrete is also kind of important, particularly when you're trying to be subtle. And yeah. if I am, you know, trying to be a merchant and be subtle, it might be helpful. So that is very true. Yeah. There is going to be uh, not only the aspect of if you're trying to sleuth through a ruin, you know, you don't want to be noticed in the first place. You don't need Actually, to be quick. Yeah, you don't need to be quick if you're just not going to get noticed. If um, they don't see you, you never need to be fast, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so a lot of these... Um, these attributes we've kind of mentioned some of them as we went through but you know your accurates your hand-eye coordination um your pers uh, your precision and timing to do things that's that's what you're accurate as it's it's aptly named um you know accurate in most cases though is it ends up being opposed by a quick score so, you know, because you're trying to, if it's a combat aspect, you're trying to hit your enemy. It's how accurate you are versus how quick your enemy is. So, Dodge, right. Yeah, exactly. That's that's where your quick comes in. Um, your cunning, as we said, goes over the, the aspects of um, how well you, you know, your, your problem solving is, your common sense, things of that nature. Discreet. You know, if you're trying to avoid being detected, to hide, smuggle something, um, to slowly follow or trail somebody, those are all going to be discrete things. And they usually are uh, opposed by an enemy's vigilance. So, you know, how vigilant that person is to notice you stuffing a, bre a piece of bread into your pocket or, you know, how vigilant you are to see somebody is trailing you discreetly. That's how that's how those work. Persuasive, exactly as you believe it. How well you can, you know, do you have a silver tongue or is it, you know, do you have a thaler tongue or is it an, you know, a shilling or or even lower level tongue? Yeah, I am a well refined <laughs> goblin. Yeah, he has a tongue of thaler. Um, <laughs> and usually your persuasive is always opposed by a resolute. Uh, your resolute is kind of like your willpower, if you will, how resolute you are in something. Um, not to try and keep using each of the words in a proper sentence, um, but I feel like it, it helps. It helps in um, explaining what they do, you know. And in that same aspect, it also works. Resolute is very important in the mystical um, practitions. Uh, mm -hmm. of Simbaroom. It's how well you can resist something, how well you could cast something. It's it's definitely um, an important value in that regard. How well you can resist the corruption. And in the aspect of corruption. If you have a low resolute, it means you have a low um, threshold to corruption. It is more apt for you to become a corrupted beast um, then may fend not be it a off. very good wizard if you're trying to tap into something that you have to pay a price for, and you're not really good at negotiating the price down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's exactly. what I would say. Your resolute is helpful for. Yes, and then of course there is strong, very self-explanatory. You know, 
Can you lift things? Can you break into doors? How strong is your character? This goblin. Very, very weak. Ten is yeah. your average line. Five is your absolute low, because even in the point buy system, you can't be, go below a five or above a fifteen. Those very are your frail. those are your limits. So fifteen, you're above average. Ten, you're average. Five, you're below average. Is a good way to look at these scores. Um, each of these attributes oh and uh vigilant we kind of talked about when we talked about discrete it's just your general awareness um how well you attune to your senses things of that nature each of these attributes of course correlates to their own checks but they also some of them have kind of like secondary aspects and these secondary aspects are how to can compute like you know your toughness your pain threshold your corruption um threshold things of this nature so toughness is equal to your strength though it can never be below 10 so even if your strong is a five your toughness is still going to be a 10 your 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 hit yeah your hit points do you know your toughness is your hit points um it is very hard to adjust your tough to get like your toughness does not change. Yes, almost at all. Pretty this is what I was talking to earlier about the the rogue arrow that strikes your mighty warrior down in one fell swoop. Yes, is that uh, and why they set the value at ten is because and, and why I I think and I think Neil would agree with me. We think this is a more realistic place type. You can't become a level twenty god, no matter how experienced you become in. Simbarum, something can always kill you. Yeah. And uh, I think that speaks to the fact that um, from a body, bodily hardiness, you know, you're, you are what you are. And you might be able to get a little buffer or do, do certain things, right? But you can't really change the nature of your, you know, what you are to a yeah. certain extent, right? You're, you're capped by that. So, yep. um Toughness, I, I feel like, is really representative of that, but always makes you a little hesitant before you go running Leroy Jenkins into any. Uh, yeah, so. I will say any aspect that I've ever um, overlorded for this game, compared to like some other tabletop RPGs, um, there's less like murder hobo actions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because because again, you could pick the wrong. You know, a blacksmith is going to be stronger than you, may have more toughness than you, and they hit you once, and you just didn't dodge right. Boom, done, over. Let's see you later. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for playing. Hey, Come back to Tabacar another side time. Of the street. Yeah. Right. Like, you, you offend the person who's homeless, who could just be there because they're a murderer, and next thing you know, they've knifed you in the back and you are dead. Yep. You, you know, you have to be... I don't, don't necessarily say you have to be more um, thoughtful. I would say, though, that... Um, I think this game rewards chances, thoughtfulness. Well, it rewards thoughtfulness, but it also puts a little bit of fear into your character and your players, because if you're worried that anybody could stab you or these things can happen, you're less inclined to want a power campaign to some extent, because... Yeah. It's very easy to, like, you can't run into a group of three people necessarily if you're not so experienced like myself <laughs> and <laughs> expects that I'm going to win. I'm probably yeah. going to get decimated pretty quickly. Yeah. So. Um, so to continue on, another thing that's strong, you know, so we have the toughness, but you may ask, well, the pain threshold here, that seems like it would relate to toughness. You would be correct. Um, pain threshold is how much your character how, how much hurt they can take in one attack so this is where having a low strong is really going to be a factor um because currently robert's goblin here has a five strong to calculate <laughs> pain threshold it's strong divided by two rounded up so that means we're sitting at a cool three I don't like 
Um, which, in the aspect of Robert getting hit, and they roll a three or higher, they've reached his pain threshold on damage. And whatever whatever aspect of uh, soak or whatever they got they got three or more damage into Robert's character. He has ten hit point, ten toughness. That's fine. He's he's down to you know seven or a little bit lower. All right, it's a it's a good hit, but he'll keep going. But his pain threshold is what's going to become a factor because as soon as your pain threshold is breaked, this enemy now gets to have more aspects. They can stun you for a round. They can do another attack on you. There's because your character is now not focused so much on what is at hand because they're writhing in pain. It, you know, it's it's the aspect that they hit you pretty good and you don't your grit almost. Like, yeah, like, yeah. If you got if you got knifed. How well can you keep going after you got knifed? Like, yeah, right? like, <laughs> yeah. You know, some people are just better at it than others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a very true point. So that's your pain threshold. Your defense, which um, isn't right up here, but it gets calculated whoop, down on the bottom right of your character sheet. Um, your defense, you will always, no matter what, with or you know, without armor have uh have some level of defense to something and that is equal to your quick minus your armor's impeding factor so right now base without any armor robert's defense is a 10 which is average um some so, armor yeah, not so great for where i'm going <laughs> Again, well, it's yeah combat don't go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If Robert sees people fighting, he's not rushing out. I will the not next... be insulting anybody. <laughs> yeah. The next big aspect um up here that we will calculate now is um your corruption threshold. Um so your corruption threshold is kind of the same thing as your your pain threshold, but in corruption. Um where if you get a, there's there's uh, temporary and permanent corruption points. A temporary point, you know, anybody could deal with. That's your resolute is how corrupt you could be. So Robert's resolute's a ten. If he hits ten, uh, ten level of corruption, he's corrupt now. He he will become wow. an abomination. He's gone. He is no longer the the goblin merchant treasure hunter he once was. Um, but up until that point, you can, you can be okay. The well, only. Okay. Is a, is a tough statement. <laughs> Cause again, you, you become a little, essentially you, you get blighted less and less yourself. Yep. The more corruption you get. And then at a certain point, when you hit your corruption threshold and go beyond that, you start to like really fall into the corruption and to point parts where like you, you might, parts of your face might fall off. <laughs> yes. You might come down with the boils all over your body. Um, and, yeah. Uh, it's not it's pretty. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, I mean, unless you're into that kind of thing, maybe. True. But technically, so here's, here's a factor. Technically you could get up to nine, temporary points of corruption and the next day you know you know over the course of days be perfectly fine because you never met your corruption threshold this is the biggest factor of corruption um your corruption threshold is again similar to your pain threshold it's your resolute divided by two rounded up robert's resolute is 10 so it'll be an easy five so that means while Robert gains temporary corruption, if he reaches a five or higher, he will end up succumbing to permanent corruption and he will get a blight mark. So that's where the aspects of what Robert was saying, you know, you, you play with that line, especially if you're a, a, a magic user, you play with that line very often 
And if you go over that line, it, it's very just it just becomes, you know, you're rolling snowball. down that snowpack. And now yep. you're just becoming, you know, a Val Kilmer snowball. You're becoming Blake a and deadly... Willow. And, yeah, zombie snowball. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's <laughs> just not well. good. <laughs> Yeah, he gets out of it pretty good, though. You know, he does. Kind of he off. lucks out. He lucks out. He doesn't. He's not injured, and uh, he's out of the snowpack. Um, that's what happens. I would when say you... when you start losing body parts, that you can't just put them back. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, there is certain aspects to lower permanent corruption, but they are more difficult to come across. Um, the game makes it a very uh, nuanced. It's 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 just a heavy option to go over, um, go over your corruption threshold because now you got permanent corruption. Um, oh, so Neil, you bring up a really good point, which about corruption, and we talked a little earlier about shadow, right, and yep. this idea of aura. And so the idea on your temporary corruption is it kind of like impacts your soul, right? Your your the aura that people who are more mystically attuned can see, mm-hmm. right? Whereas permanent corruption, to Neil's point, is visible. Like, that's what others can see, right? And when somebody has visible corruption, it's very uh, easy to identify them as somebody who dabbles in, you know, the more mystical and dark yep. arts and could be potentially, you know, um, turned, well, for lack and of that's a better term. and that's the other thing. Just because yeah. your shadow may have corruption doesn't mean you are evil. Um, right. So many shadows throughout the world of Simbaroon, as you're playing the 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 game Simbaroon, will have corruption. Your own shadow may have corruption, especially if you're a magic user. It's it's the difference of being you know covered in that corruption or. Or you know, just having small flecks of of corruption on your on your shadow. Right. But you can get lost in it. You know, the That's... the idea there is that magic in this game is very powerful. Yep. And to tap into it, you're tapping into powers that Neil said they have a cost. And that cost, you know, very early on is manageable. Yep. But at a certain point you tip the scales and the cost becomes physical to the point where it can you know kill your character Mm -hmm. right or even turn your character into something they the abomination which you can read about in the book that you know at that point you've become mindless you no longer control who you are and you can never come back yeah you are essentially lost to the darkness yes yeah so it's it's a very dangerous move um but that covers most fire. yeah that covers pretty much most of our uh our aspects for um attributes um we've already picked our, our races but they do they do kind of go through all of that it, again some great artwork you know you have different forms of ombrians um they tell you they give you hints at names as well um there's some ombrian traits um so like if you picked a human that's an ombrian you know you can select one of the um the traits that allows you to be you know privileged you get you what is it you start with 50 thaler because the opposite of the pariah trait yeah. privileged puts you ahead of everything in civilized society um and when gives deal- you additional funding well i'll say not so much right, correct. civilized there, society here well yeah. <laughs> it, it's not so much civilized society it's ombrian society ombrian so society, privileged yeah. lets you so if you're you know playing your game is running through an ombrian society you're going through all of their regions you you will be better off. That privilege trait makes you better off. Where the pariah trait is more respected in barbarian esque um, communities. Um, you know, if you have an Ombrian that's going through barbarian territories, where the barbarians are are more apt to gather with goblins, ogres, and things of that nature, be one with nature you're not you're you know if you're a pariah you're going to be better off than an ombrian walking through there 
Yeah, you know, we haven't really talked about that in the Simba Room game, um, but there there is this constant duality at play between uh, nature, the natural world, yes, and then the uh, I'll call it the want of some of the human society and others to kind of um, control and manipulate the natural world yeah. into some kind of other order. And those two things are always at, at, at odds with one another, yes. kind of similar to, to the corruption. So to Neil's point, the um, privileged really comes to the Ombre society, which is really trying to, you know, maintain and create like separate from nature where the pariah really is being more one with nature or creatures that come from nature that are outside of state. Yeah, you don't society. need money. You don't need these things because you usually forage for your stuff where a privileged a person who has the privilege trait they're they're going to be more apt to, you know, financially in a financial culture be higher up you know what i mean they deem material things more than anything else um right. you could also have a contacts thing with the queen's folk where you are just more tied to the nobles is is one of the things for the Ambrians. where the barbarians you know bushcraft or their noble heritage contacts you could have which bushcrafting is the aspect that you can you know you can go out and adventure through nature you know find your way and survive off of it with bushcraft where you know somebody who doesn't understand nature doesn't understand how to travel how to go through how to survive doesn't have those capabilities but that's like some of the differences that you would find in these race breakdowns you know here's changelings they can shapeshift um change their being which changelings are very interesting, but I won't get really into that because we're doing character creation. You have yeah, ogres. We're doing, goblins. we're doing goblins, man. Yeah, and then we got goblins. So one of those, you know, goblins have both trait, uh, have both the short-lived and the pariah trait. Um, pretty much it just states goblins don't live for a long period of time, which isn't so um far away from a lot of other tabletop rpgs yeah but in the aspect of other things like goblins aren't just you know small creatures they can be any size in this um there's there they lose a little bit of that description aspect um yeah. but they're they're pretty cool i really like them yeah, so we'll get the pariah. Well, I guess I guess that means I get the pariah and the short-lived trait. Yeah. So short-lived means that uh, I will never live to be older than forty. Um. So somewhere in the late thirties. So, um. I guess, and I think it also says that uh, young adulthood starts around five, ten being more advanced, and then. Um, usually by the time you're 20, you're moving into like the old age category. Those over 30 are rare, they say. So in that vein, I want to be a little more than just young. So I was thinking maybe eight. Um, essentially, I've had some time. I've aged. I've come out of the wilderness. I have some, some skill set. Um, but I'm still relatively young in the, in the scheme of things. Gotcha. Okay. And then pariah uh, just Which... means that I have to roll ch roll twice in social challenges, and then I pick the worst roll uh, when interacting with other. Uh, but when it, when they're interacting with other goblins, uh, I can roll twice, and I choose the better of the roll. So, so to everything we just talked about. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I want a really high persuasion is because. Then I won't have to, if I roll twice and I roll badly, hopefully my chances are better stats to where I can be successful. Yeah. I gotta sell I gotta sell those privileged folks the you know, the stuff that I can, so Yeah. So we would just write um, those right in here. 
Um, which actually, on the next page, here is the pariah ability. Um, and then I want to say... It's funny, because short is not right there. It's on the two pages later. But yeah. Right. So, and those would go right into... Um, because I want to say, I just got to make sure I'm reading my stuff correctly. Yep. There's, uh, it would go right into your abilities and powers. That's where your traits would go in, anything you kind of go. They give you this much of a section because a lot of the time you kind of pick your stuff and you'll, uh, increase it with experience wise. Um, you won't have like 20 billion abilities. That would be ridiculous. You gotta, you gotta kind of upgrade your abilities because they come in you know novice adept and master so there's three different levels to most abilities traits they're very that's what it is um, so you bring up the next great point which is also part of my race um the goblin has the ability uh or can can take the ability survival instinct mm -hmm. which is a race specific ability so this is not available to humans for instance um one of the nice things about survival instinct is that in some of the later ranks um it gives some nice bonuses particularly i really like that adept level one where it allows me to add a permanent plus one d4 um kind of like armor natural armor to my defense and since i am not very good in combat I really like that idea. So, you know, when we were talking earlier about getting your list together of abilities, mm -hmm. it's important to take some of your racial abilities into consideration and identifying whether or not, you know, they're, they're ones that you might want to take. So oh, in time. this case, I definitely would. But if I was playing, let's say, a barbarian or even like a, 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 a goblin knight, I might be less inclined to take survival instinct over something like an armor. Uh, skill. Yeah. So you are taking that. Did you? Uh, so is that going to be? So I guess here's another That'll aspect. Into I think that leads us into the abilities. Yeah. Right? So before we go, before we go too far into that, we're going to have survival instinct written here because you know you're going to take it, but we don't know yet. How do we figure out how many abilities we get? Or do they all start at novice? Can we have some at adept? And that's um, kind of where the beautiful chapter of abilities comes in. Mm -hmm. um, you get abilities that are rated at three levels, as we said. Um, as you, you go through, um, you can always use what the ability was below your slot. So if you're an adept, you have your adept ability and you still have the novice ability of that, um, the usage of it. So at master, you get to use all three levels cumulative. of the ability. Yep, right, exactly. Cumulative. And there, each abilities are broken down into different actions. Some are an active action, some are free actions, some are passive. Um, some's a reaction, and then some are special. Um, they're all a little bit different, but in character creation, at a base level, you will get to pick a avenue of... I just had it on my page. Uh, it's, it's either two, well, yep. two of the novice skills and one adept skill, or you can take five... Uh, not skills. skills, and um, there is you know, we talked about leveling in the beginning, there is no levels because experience is the cost, so you have to pay experience to get abilities. They don't explain it, um, in the book because it's supposed to be less, less mathematics, less, less you worrying about numbers. Um, but the way we look at it, <laughs> we've kind of figured how much experience you can get. And this could help you for creating, you know, as what we are doing here, eventually, you know, we're going to have higher level characters than just a starting character. We're creating adventurers who have already done some missions, done some stuff. They're going to be experienced. 
Um, so really, your starting experience at first level is um, 50 experience points. R roughly equal to 50 experience roughly points. Roughly equal. The reason why they don't kind of lay it out in any other way is so you have to use up all of your 50 experience points. You can't hold on to them for your starting level, and that's why they tell you what the breakdown would be. Because that's kind of Technically, just... if you if you're just starting, you really don't have any experience, right? Yeah. So that's part of the other reason they don't get into this um, in the book. But to your point, they have like a little section on uh, how many how much experience you have to spend to get a novice ability, which is ten, and yep. how much experience you then have to get to get an adept ability. Once you have the novice, is another twenty. And then to go up to master is another 30. So when you really think about it, two novice and one adept is, you know, 30 experience points at the novice level, and then another 20 for that one to go up to adept. Yep. And then the five is pretty self-explanatory. So if if you are building a more advanced character, right, Neil? Um, yep. The point is, is you could kind of just take that experience all into consideration when really mapping out your character. Yeah. Um, but for here, we are going to start creation just like a level one, and then we will right. add on after. So I'm giving everybody, well, we'll just do this, and then I'll tell you how much experience you have to work with afterwards. So, right. For so, sure. I, so when I put my list together, you know, thinking about my goblin... I, uh, I survival instinct obviously stood out to me. That was one I wanted to add, yep. but I want to keep to that merchant um, aesthetic. And mm. war master is one of the main abilities that really helps to this kind of merchant ability. Lore master um, is the ability for your character to understand cultural differences, but also to know. Um, different pieces of information about artifacts throughout the ages, different lost relics, sites. Um, it's kind of like understanding the history of the world and some of the, the things that were a part of it. And so I really felt like, um, and one of the other, you know, in some of the advanced uh, abilities is being able to use those relics or artifacts because some of them, you know, over time, people have forgotten how to use them. Mm -hmm. So... Um, think of, you know, VCRs. Some people don't even know what VCR is. You know, already a lore master, right? Um, but <laughs> so, so lore master really plays into that really well. So I decided that lore master was another skill I really wanted to utilize. Was the um, um was that going to be a novice adept for these uh, first couple of levels, or what were you thinking? Well, so what I what I did first is I got my list together, and mm -hmm. then I kind of evaluated whether I what ones I thought were important for me at a base level, right? Gotcha. And then what ones I thought I could grow into as okay. as the character evolves. So I started with survival instinct, lore master, leader, um, which is another one that allows me to supplement my cunning checks for. Or sorry, my persuasive checks for resolute checks. Mm -hmm. um, steadfast, which allows me to be more resistant and hardy against um, external threats, whether they're against my mind or me physically. Um, and tactician. Tactician was really uh, interesting to me because it allows me to tap into my cunning ability and replace things like my quick uh, for initiative roles or defense roles and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So because I have such a high cunning, but my quick is, you know, more average, um, tactician really appealed to me in that way. And so I kind of settled on these five skills that I really liked, but I didn't, I didn't know how, how to build them. Um, so for the initial level, though, I realized Survival instinct, because I really need that extra AC bonus, was mm -hmm. going to be super important. Um, so I actually decided to go with the one adept and two novice. So I picked survival instinct to be my adept skill. And then I picked leader and tactician to be my two novice level skills. Leader allows me, again, to use my cunning, uh, or sorry, my persuasive in place of my uh, resolute. And tactician... Um, allows me to use my uh, 
let's see, it allows me to use my cunning for things like quick on initiative. So that would give me some, some kind of like, if at I least got to be able combat, to get out of yeah combat. Well, first. I could hopefully act first, so I could run away. If yeah. I can't talk my way out of it, right? Yeah. And if I can't do those two things, then my survival instinct will kick in, and hopefully I can survive until I can either get help or get out of the situation. Yeah. So I felt like those those ones were kind of the the most helpful for me as I started my character. Gotcha. And then you went into. So after survival instinct, tactician, and uh, leader. Leader. So that was your, you know, you started off adept, novice, novice. Then you got, I gave you guys to be more experienced adventurers. Um, mm -hmm. I gave you guys 100 experience points to spend oh. as you would. And this 100 experience points, just for those at home, um, the way experience kind of works in game is... You can hold on to it. You can use it. You can spend it. You know, sometimes there's optional rules. You can spend it to reroll dice. Um, you kind of use it as luck points that other systems have had to fudge rolls a little bit. Um, there's a lot that they have written just in the core rule book that you can use experience for besides just upgrading your abilities. Um, mm -hmm. So I told all the people playing they would get an additional 100 XP to use as they wished. Um, so to Neil's point, for instance, uh, I plan to use all my experience. There you go. But I know some of some of the others of us plan to use most of it and keep some in a pool, so that way when they run into hairy situations, they can tap into that experience pool. Because me personally, I like to do almost all the additional rules because um, I think it makes it a very interesting, um, yeah. and it gives more. Uh, I'm an agent of chaos. I really am. So more aspects of chaos to be thrown into it, you know, stuff to really make things just go off the rails. I'm all about it. And I love to play devil's advocate with people's experience. Yeah. <laughs> you so. could use that experience now to not take that hit, or you could become master in something. <laughs> Neil, try, Neil tries to pick you against yourself to say, well, you got 30 experience points, and man, Master looks really good, but if you don't dodge this hit right now, you're going to be dead. So, yeah. you, choices, or choices, you'll be really choices. injured. Yeah, your leg will be broken. Um, um, but you so, spend all of yours. Yeah, so since you had given, given us 100 experience points in addition, I decided that I could buy... Um, Steadfast and Loremaster, which were two of the others on my list. Mm -hmm. uh, and Loremaster, um, both of those at a novice level, is 10. And then I decided that I really liked both of them, and I wanted to continue in them and also buy Adept. So I spent 30 in total in Steadfast and 30 in total in Loremaster to get two Adept. So that's 60 points. Mm-hmm. And then I decided that I wanted to level tactician and leader equally, so I did another um, 20, 20 and 20, 20 um, to put those up, and that's how I got to my full 100. So I'm yeah, I, I could have dipped into some other abilities or skills, uh, or abilities they're not called skills. Yep. But I really felt like um, with my level of experience. And that moving some of these into adept level uh, really allowed my character to be much more, uh, I think, in character with my the play style I'm I'm going for. So gotcha. Well, and it, like, and this is just every aspect of character recreation. You know, when you have so many different avenues you can go to, yeah, it sounds great to you know become a jack of all trades yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and it's and it's great to have that and it's you know being a master of one is not good either um because then you're very this is all you can do you can't do anything else in this game i feel especially you want to you know be maybe in two three things like that you're focused on not be in only two to three abilities um because that would be just very very well, so, focused um where yeah. you can they all play off of each other 
but they help you in different scenarios. You know, and I and I think that's exactly a, a good aspect you did with these abilities. Thanks. I, I do think to add to your point, you know, it's it's always important. Um, one of the things we didn't really talk about and we don't really need to get into is there's a core idea in Simbarum about um you know, a group having a core mission, right? Yeah. What's the goal, the goals of your group? And so you have to really think about how your characters work together, right? So yeah. my character uh, definitely specializes, but my hope and <laughs> prayer <laughs> with the rest of my group from our discussion is that they're going to specialize in other areas that I am not, I'm not so savvy in to help round us out as a team. So that way, to, to Neil's point, I don't have to take, you know, 10 different novice abilities, right? I can take more adept specialized skills because others in my group and my party will handle some of the other aspects that I don't do. Yeah, no, that's and that's exactly it. Like, Timber Room is definitely one of the games you want everybody who's playing at the table. You want to discuss what you guys are going to be playing as um, you don't you want to make sure you hit all the other areas. But they also know, which is, I think, just another part. It's not even about character creation. It's kind of about the game. They ha they have avenues for, for you to fill your spots. NPCs going along with your party is very important. Um, and they give that avenue for smaller classes, like for smaller groups. So mm -hmm. we're only having a group of three. It wouldn't be inconceivable to have some NPCs going with you guys, either as hired mercenaries, whatever it may be, going into some of those higher expeditions. Uh, so just, you know, also keep that in mind if you're watching this as a, uh, you know, uh, overlord or, you know, game master, and you're trying to figure out, yeah, how does a character get created, but what should I be looking at as a game master? You know. So, we did abilities. There is... Pages on pages of abilities. I'll, you know, there's just many of them. We're consolidating. <laughs> um, very much consolidating because abilities is one factor. And the only factor that Robert really had to look at with his character creation, because then you have the mystical traditions. Um, which I did I, not dive into. He did not dive into. We will talk about it very quickly. Um, it takes its own form because now you kind of got to split between your abilities and powers uh, or your abilities into these powers. And each of these still takes um, a slot of your either novice or adept or however your breakdown is. Um, they take that experience to learn these things. And your mystical tradition helps you defy how you got your powers. Um, some is through wizardry, some through sorcery, some through their religion, um, some just through witchcraft. And then you have independent mystics who have learned or studied this gift on their own. They're self-taught. Um, and each of these mystical traditions is open to, could be limited by what their tradition is magic wise. They can only select magic of that tradition, or they could study any tradition, um, which you've seen in other RPGs, you know, wizards have their spell lists and Dungeons and Dragons, things like that. But they have, they have kind of similar in the aspect that, you know, certain schools are only going to focus on certain things. Yeah. To add, to add to that, they school is a good, I, you know, almost like a good way of thinking about it, right? Like the, the difference between the magic uh, traditions. Yes. Um, but to the, the last one that Neil touched on, which is like the self-trained mystic, um, there's no school to learn from. You kind of just pick up abilities as you go. There is some pluses and minuses to that. So the plus is that you can learn skills or uh, mystic powers from any kind of tradition. The minus is that without the tradition as an ability itself, you don't 
you're somewhat less specialized, more generalized in there. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't get some of there's sometimes additional benefits, or there are um, ways that it actually reduces the cost, right, um, yes. to your character. So sometimes specializing in a particular tradition um, helps you more than being more broad. But again, it's it, you know it's play style and flavor and what you're looking for. And well, and, um, and, and because like, Simbaroon focuses like corruption is one of their big uh, mechanics. It is it is one of the big styles of things. The, anybody who goes into a mystical tradition, you know, just an independent mystic, they, you know, it's just explained that corruption's a double-edged sword, or the independence, the free will is a double-edged sword. Because yes, you can study anything you, you, you want to, but you don't understand what maybe the wizards already right. know for their spells and how to keep their corruption down. You're just going to learn it for yourself. Yeah. Right? You're just going to learn. Future. I can cast this spell, but the cost may be two times it of one who has the talent, who has, you know, trained, oh, training. And, you, yeah. you know, has the schooling of it. And that's the, yeah. and, and each, each of the mystic traditions has a different way of handling corruption. That's, that's very much their avenues. Yep. Um, the mystical powers, there's there's many a different spells. They all relate, you know, so there's the Thurgy, the Sorcerer, the Witchcraft, blah, blah, blah. But they, you know, they all are very much written the same as an ability. And anybody who ends up becoming, goes to a mystical tradition, you now have to balance, all right, how many spells do, how many mystical powers do I want versus regular abilities? Am I just going to go all mystical powers and hope somebody else in my group covers some of the utility of abilities? Am I going to try and run both? It's it, it becomes another balancing act because you're diversifying your character in a, in in two ways or or you're just going mystical powers um so it's 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 different in that sense because sometimes i feel like in a lot of other tabletop rpgs yeah you get your focus of all right i'm a melee i'm a range or i'm a wizard you know i'm a spellcaster um but roughly they can still all be good in similar skills and i feel like in this if you are a mystic um your your mystical powers they they're great but they come at a at a cost you know yeah. they they definitely they definitely showcase the cost of magical powers well they make it they do a good job of um making everything accessible yes you can i mean it's it, it's a beauty and a curse sometimes is that and that, i think that's why they put together all these different archetypes and uh, suggestions is because you can. It's easy to get lost in the sheer open-endedness that the system offers. Is that you're not tied down to anything uh, at any time. For instance, if my character wanted to branch out and learn uh, some kind of magic, I might just have to find somebody who helps me learn that or hone that ability within game. But there's nothing to stop me from doing it. Yeah. The thing that I would be harmed for, though, is without those mystical traditions of training, um, to hone the abilities becomes difficult. Now, I can still do that. I can still pick up those mystical trainings and I can learn them. But, um, you know, as, as we discussed earlier, you only get to pick two, you know, two novice abilities and an adept ability or five novice abilities when you first yeah. start, right? And so it becomes really important that you think through um, as a, a spell, somebody who deals in, in magic and spells, um, kind of what those costs are going to be. Because to Neil's point, you lose some of the ability to do, you know, the more mundane abilities, I guess. Yeah. No, and that's, you know, because you've been studying your mystical power. You haven't been studying how to survive in the woods. You know, right. That's, that's the you, idea. You are not a leader. Yeah. or a tactician <laughs> you throw fireballs at yeah your exactly or you can bend Which, somebody's will and you don't need to have a leading feat because you, you just control them yeah. well, who, who needs to be a leader skill when you can just control everybody else's mind and be the de facto leader right yeah uh, i will rule through fear and sheer will rather than <laughs> love yeah. So, 
All right, that that's your quote. You're gonna lead <laughs> sheer will. <laughs> Here and sure will. <laughs> um, so after we get through the abilities, your character's really coming together. You know, have you thought of a name for your character? Because every character needs to have a name. Oh, I've got a name. Oh, hit me with it. Spurts McSpunk. Spurts McSpunk. <laughs> this after goes after his it's it's normal for robert to i guess play goblins in this game um That's so it's the only game i play like goblins so there's yeah that. um because he had a goblin named Jack before and now we have a spurt mix spot yeah um your shadow because we could definitely start depicting what your shadow is you have your abilities you have no corruption to you your corruption right. Is a zero, um, kind of the way that they explain um, shadows is in the aspect that uh, your shadow is depicting of the environment or the uh, the uh, relation to nature that you have. Um, people, people who have you know who may be more urbanized would have like copper. You know they have they have more like of a uh, metallic metallic yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 where people have made you know if you're more of a natural sort you're gonna have greens you you know you could have things that represent what you would depict as colors of nature is the best way for me to explain it because I can say what I think my colors would be you know what I would think all oh, natures are these colors and. You know, but they're more bland. You have metallic oh, versus oh, like pastels. Say, you know what I mean? But um, so I like to think that for spurts, his um, his hues of his uh, shadow would be uh, orange with fringes of shimmering green moss and yellow fungus. representing those colors in nature if you were more yep. urbanized you might say like metallic gunmetal <laughs> you know, like um things that have a refining process yeah that might be another good way to you know and and the best way to um because then they talk about well how would you characterize if corruption became on your shadow so like one of the, for what your description is right here like the the fungus is starting to ooze blackness as it's starting to decay mm -hmm. um you know that that shimmering green moss is maybe starting to burn yeah, not so bright more like a puke green yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 where somebody who is maybe more in touch with like an ombrian who is more urbanized more in touch with uh, developmental um, aspects of society there maybe they have a very copper brass hue but now it's starting to corrode and and turn green. green you know what i mean that's that's that corruption are settling you, in are you insinuating that the lady liberty is corrupted she could she could have used her mystic powers too much and she may be on the form of an abomination i'm not <laughs> confirming or denying I'm just saying, if the Statue of Liberty starts shooting fireballs out of its torch... We wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> fireballs of freedom. Fireballs of freedom. Um, so that, that takes care of some of those aspects. You know, we have the experience. Um, you have zero unspent experience. Because, again, even though we said, you know, you, you can almost calculate it to 150 experience... Robert's character has only earned a hundred experience because everything else was starting feats or starting abilities. Sorry. Um, I'll let you think of a good quote, you know, I got it. Hands off that shiny <laughs> shirt. That's mine. For all you Lord of the Rings fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> my precious 
hands off that shiny shirt. That's mine. Um, so then we would go into the aspects, you know, we've done our archetypes, we've done our abilities, um, we've, we've gotten some equipment, but remember, there is the aspect of, earlier on, we kind of mentioned it, um, certain attributes could, uh, or abilities could impact what starting equipment you could have. And the reason mm -hmm. why they kind of do it that way is so that if you are a fighter, you don't just start off with a dagger and a staff and then have to go into your uh, your your thaler that uh, that you start off with. Um, in other aspects, like Robert's character right now, I'm pretty positive does not get anything special. Um. They just start off with the base. Oh my gosh, I lost the page. Wah, wah, wah. You just got to control F it, right? Control F, man. Control F. I'll figure it out. There it is. So, like, some starting equipment, if, like, you took the ability men at arms, you could start off with medium armor, is what they suggest. Um, so if there is a specific ability that you would have, like the ones specified in the book, so men at arms, marksman, pole arm, shield fighter, steel throw, twin attack, two handed force, witch hammer, they, they'll give you starting equipment with those things. Otherwise you get to choose from the following, you know, a sturdy staff and a dagger, a single-handed weapon and a dagger, a ranged weapon and a dagger. What are you thinking, Robert? So no matter what, you're going to get a dagger. Boom. Yeah. Um, do you want to go for the ranged weapon, the sturdy staff, or the single-handed weapon? I think... Hmm... Good question. I think I'll go for the ranged weapon. All right. Again, so I don't really want to be in combat. I think that's a good idea. For for right now, as a place helper, holder, we're gonna a place helper. Yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna put in ranged weapon. Um. Do you then also be able to select an ordinary light armor? So we're just gonna you know over here. Right now, I'm just gonna put in some some form of light armor, and then we'll go into the equipment slot. So that would be for right now for these aspects of character creation. We're only gonna go into equipment selection for a starting level. We're not gonna worry about um, what I am going to give them for having experience and stuff like that, because that's going to be completely up to your, the discretion of your overlord, your game master, whatever they refer to themselves as. I like to call myself an overlord, you know, reasons. Um, but I'll let the audience decide what those are. <laughs> yeah. But um, the reason for this is we just want to show you what it would be like to create a starting character. And I can depict, we're not going to do a shopping episode here. We're just going to do base base starting stuff so you'd get a light armor a ranged weapon and a dagger um plus whatever your five thaler gives you and you know your starting equipment you already have you know your sleeping roll stuff of that nature so you wouldn't have to worry about much else um the only things besides equipment that's really left is uh you know more of the rp style of hey. you know what your appearance your is you know yeah exactly your appearance what your background your personal goals for this character what are they trying to do and really after you figure those aspects out you're ready to play um so we'll just take a look really quick at uh explaining some of the I'm just going to find the page that I want to get to. Um, doo, 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 doo. 
Sorry, folks at home. I'm also flipping through my books to then find the page easily for uh, for you at home. Oh my! I just needed to go one more page. Look, look at that. <laughs> um, equipment. So equipment goes into different aspects of weapons. Um, they have different qualities. Um, they could be a heavy weapon, which is going to deal different damage. So in the core book, they'll give you a base, a very base level of equipment. It's not anything super in depth, but they give you the mechanics of how a heavy weapon would look. And then they show, they state, this is what we believe it would be a heavy weapon. Um, so like a double ax that they believe is going to be a heavy weapon. So it's going to deal 1d10. But a double axe has the quality of deep impact. So it's going to deal an additional one, you know, an additional the piece movie. of damage. Yeah, the movie. <laughs> um, then it's then it's other... A double axe of deep impact. <laughs> the double axe of deep impact. That sounds like the second version of deep impact. Yeah. Yeah, um, deep impact 2, electric boogaloo. <laughs> it's deep, deep impact 2, the impact thing. Um, <laughs> um so besides just the regular damage breakdown or what the weapon is is it a heavy weapon is it a long weapon is it a projectile weapon single-handed weapon shield short weapon throwing weapon unarmed attack unarmed attack really won't have it'll have qualities but all of these weapons can have a quality that then makes it different and that could change the fact of how well it's used. Can it be used in, you know, two weapon fighting? Is does it, you know, have deep impact? Can it deal more damage? Is it um, precise so it can use different features on the on the weapon instead of just using accurate? Can you use a different ability for it? These are all different things that the game kind of goes through. And talks about the qualities for them. Um, so it does a really good aspect of, well, I have this weapon that I want, but it's not in the game. Well, what is it? Is it a heavy weapon? No, it's a one-handed weapon. All right, so it'll deal this much damage. Do you want any of these abilities with it? And, and it helps you even create stuff on your own level. So, you know, do, 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 do. a dagger, there is no real base dagger you know you have a parrying dagger or a stiletto they're both daggers but you get to select a dagger at start so you could select either one and a parrying dagger is going to be balanced it's going to allow you to do, do, do let me just go to the parrying dagger for you guys you know um it has the function of balance that oh my lord why can i not find where balance is Give me one second. Yeah, there it is. It's a couple more pages. So we're we're at qualities. Balance. This weapon is going to provide a plus one to your defense. Makes sense why they call it a parrying dagger, and that's its quality. I think I want that parrying dagger. I need my <laughs> defense to be high. That's it. So you'd end up getting parrying dagger. And so that's one of like the really cool things that Simbaroon does. It gives you qualities for weapons and they give you ideas for it, but really you could end up making whatever weapon you want because they give you the easy breakdown. For it. Um, Let's get and, it approved by your overlord. Yes, that's, that's the big factor. Um, and then even, you know, armor has qualities. So, you know, is it fe is it flexible? Is it uh, let's look at some of these other ones. Cumbersome. Those seem to be really the only two they give you. Um, I was afraid there's the only two. Armor is a trade off in this uh, game. So yes. By wearing armor, you actually reduce your defense score. Mm -hmm. However, that reduction in your defense score is tied to an increase in in what we colloquially have named damage soak yeah. <laughs> the ability to absorb the damage that you take so the 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 flip side is is 
Yes, your defense goes down, which makes you a little bit more easier to hit. But if you ever were to get hit, instead of taking full damage, you take some lesser amount based on whatever your armor absorbs from the impact. Yeah. So, you know, they go light, medium, heavy. Um, and the impeding factor, so what Robert said, what the defense is, because remember your defense is your quick minus your uh, impeding of armor. So if your impeding is a two because you have light armor, then it would be whatever your quick is, which Robert's is 10, minus two, his quick would then be, or his defense would be an eight. So that means anybody who's rolling an attack on him, they are going to be more likely to hit him. But if they do hit him, now it's a, a D4 armor soak that light armor gives you. And you could end up having, you know, the the ability of flexible, which now makes your armor, um, your impeding, one less. So instead of it being a minus two, it'll be a minus one for light armor. And for medium mm -hmm. armor, instead of being a minus three, it'd be a minus two. Heavy, same thing, minus four, minus three. Want that flexibility. So Gotta be you... able to stretch my knees. And that's exactly it. So the projection would be a 1d4. And he's going to get a... Um, he's going to end up technically having to pay for a flexible um, armor. Which he wouldn't almost be able to do right off the bat. For and right afford it levels level zero. Or yep. experience zero. So the quality is going to have an impeding of a minus two um so that means at regular if he's wearing his light armor it's an eight and then if he has no armor he's actually more he's able to dodge but again he doesn't have that soak but if you remember his parrying dagger gives him a plus one to his defense so his defenses would end up also getting those and he would either have an 11 without armor or a nine with armor Mm -hmm. So these are these are your factors, and folks, that's you now have a, a character created, you know, minus all of the the uh, development side of things. You could you we could play it right now, um, and that's all it takes, folks. Not win. <laughs> so my character would break the fourth wall and kill the Overlord. So well, good luck. <laughs> I'll take your goblin. I just need to hit him once. I don't know. Well, yeah, good luck in him. Well, he's not going to fight me. It's not in his nature. He's going to run away. <laughs> he's going to shoot you through the fourth wall. Steal all your artifacts. That's it. Well, I don't count many artifacts, so he's going to come up empty-handed on that one. Oh, oh, dang. Yeah. But thank you very much, Robert, for coming on and uh, doing character creation with us. Can't wait to start our game, which we will hopefully be recording here and then posting up for you guys as we do a little uh, one shot that I created. So um, make sure to stay tuned. Robert, can't wait for Spurt McSpunk to uh, spurt. <laughs> spurt and Spunk. I'm going to spurt all over <laughs> your enemies. You know? Um, folks at home, thank you very much. Hopefully, it wasn't it was more helpful than hurtful, <laughs> and uh, we helped you in your creation of your own goblin merchant treasure hunter. Thank you again for watching uh, watching us here at the Bone Pony Ranch Studios, and this is Neil signing off for Table Totality. Tabletop totality. That just shortened our name completely. Look at me go. Keep oh. adventuring, bone ponies. <laughs>